Good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying lunch. My name is Ed Chase. I'm the vice president of conferences for LRP Publications. And on behalf of the entire LRP family, uh, welcome. Welcome to Campus Technology. Welcome to ABLE. And welcome to the Executive Summit. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the show, thank you for your patience at our registration desk yesterday and this morning. If you did not receive an actual badge or a conference bag any time after lunch, please wander down to registration and we'll get you taken care of. It's all part of our attendee fitness program, so we're doing our best to encourage you to get your 10,000 steps. And that's my story. I'm sticking to that. For those of you involved with uh, CT Summit, the tour leaves immediately following this lunch. So you can either meet Jen in the hallway right outside these doors, or you can go down uh, and meet the bus, which will be at the Boylston Street exit of the, of the Heinz Center. So my recommendation, meet Jen right outside, and she'll take you downstairs and get you where you need to go. Now let's get to why we are here. This afternoon we are honored to have a special presentation by Beth Porter, Vice President of edX. edX is the leading nonprofit open source MOOC provider founded by MIT and Harvard in 2012. edX has grown to offer more than 500 courses to more than 4 million students from around the globe. Beth is Vice President of Product and leads the strategy, development, and implementation of edX's product roadmap. Prior to edX, Beth was Vice President of Software Product Management at Pearson Education, where she led product and service development for large-scale online education systems. Beth has spent her career envisioning and developing computer-enabled and online teaching and learning experiences. This expertise helps edX develop a cutting-edge platform to help professors, learners, and institutions transform education. She holds degrees from Cornell University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Beth Porter. Good morning, afternoon. I'm not sure how close we are at the moment. Oh, I'm not sure which mic I'm going to be using here. Give me one moment. Okay, today we're going to be talking about technology. We're going to be talking about education, and we're going to be talking about learners all over the globe. Our mission, edX's mission, and I suspect the mission of so many of you out there, is to try to educate and move forward education for as many people in many different ways as you possibly can. And so that's where we share a goal and where I hope the points that I make today, using edX very much in the foreground, but I hope general ideas that really apply to a lot of, um, a lot of your workplaces um, will be you know, something that uh, resonates with you in the kind of work that you do. So these are the themes that I think will dominate education going forward. We'll cover each one of these in great detail, but let me just say a couple words about each one here as introduction. Education is going to have to become more accessible. And for those of you who are thinking accessibility and you know, being able to meet the needs of people who can't uh, learn in traditional ways or are blind or have other uh, disabilities, that's not exactly what I mean. I mean accessible to everyone, everywhere, all over the globe. And so our goal as a MOOC provider really is access. And so that's what I mean by accessibility, although we do have an accessibility um, project as well. Going to be global. No longer are you going to be limited to just the, you know, the people at this table or the people in your classroom or the people on your campus, although many of them may be coming from other places around the world. You'll be able to connect with people across the globe as a routine part of your learning, not just as a here and there, once in a while, oh yes, I, I met somebody online from, from China yesterday, right? This is going to be a routine part of your learning going forward. Lifelong. I'll talk about the gaps that happen between K-12 or high school, college, college and career, and then ongoing. And I think a lot of what we uh, 
struggle with in university education in particular is how to bridge those two sides, right? How do you get people ready? How do you get them to stay into college? How do you get them ready for career after college? So we'll talk some about, about lifelong learning and creating alternative pathways for that. It's going to be increasingly personalized. I'll talk about personalization and somewhat about adaptive in the context of being able to supply education at a massive scale, right? not just intimately inside the classroom, but across the globe. And so their personalization takes on a whole new dimension. You can't just reach out and touch the person that's in front of you in your classroom and say, what help do you need right now? It's a much, much different kind of problem. So personalization is going to become important and technology enabled, and it is already. Talk a little bit about blended learning and the goal of being able to use technology to help actually make the residential, on-ground, campus-based experiences that much richer and, um, and be able to harness what we are using in the online environment in the classroom environment. And then finally, I'm using the phrase unbundled. And what I mean here, and we'll talk a little bit about as we go on, is the idea that you don't have to go to a single provider anymore, right? Enroll in college, stay in that college, graduate from it with a degree in that college, but that you can get your education from multiple providers, and that still that's a successful collection that somebody would look at and say, I, I know what that thing is. That has value on the open marketplace, and I'm willing to give you a job because of it, right? Because that's really what we're talking about. So I think all of those topics, all of those themes are cross-cutting. They apply to, um, to every kind of learning context, and, uh, and I'll provide one um, you know, very uh, strongly with uh, uh, what we're doing at edX. So here's the edX mission. It's three-prong. Simple to describe, hard to execute. <laughs> one, it's to increase access to education worldwide. Our original and still strongest part of our mission is to get as many people access to high quality education as possible around the globe. That means having extremely large scale services, multi-language, high availability, different kinds of learning experiences that meet people's needs at different levels of ability, meeting people where they are, being able to have something that they can adapt and grow with as they learn more. So access remains our biggest goal and the one that will be most persistent as we continue to go forward. Not to take anything away from the other two goals, however, which are very important to us and a lot of how we can make the first goal be possible. One is improving on-campus education. So I was, as I was alluding to earlier, blended learning is not just the, is not the only way that we help people improve their on-campus education. Even just having the systems that could be the new ways in which people deliver any kind of education on campus, blended or otherwise. We are working very closely with the partners that we have to try to see whether they can have a more aggressive strategy around um, education using open source, using new technologies, using new integration techniques. It's a big part of what we do is campus-based is campus learning, not just MOOCs. And then the third thing, again, enabled very much by partners who are using those course materials in residential programs, but also in MOOCs, is research. And collecting data, and I'll show some graphs and talk a little bit about data later, uh, collecting data on every single event in the system, every single click, every single answer, right, wrong, every single everything that a student does in the system, we're collecting that data and then helping universities and our partners to figure out what, what questions can be asked. What analysis can they perform? What can we learn about what just got delivered and say it's effective, it isn't effective, it's a game changer, it's something small but really important, whatever it is they want to be able to say about the education that's been offered, research and data is going to really drive a lot of that. 
So we covered this already. Uh, one thing I want to mention here is that uh, we're open source. And it's actually a important, I won't cover a lot about open source, um, but it's actually a real important part of our, it has become a very important part of our mission. And uh, a lot of the contributions that we get and the learnings that we have are from our open source contributors. People who have ideas, they want to share those with us. We find value in those things, and then we merge them into the platform. We would be fools to believe that we are the only generators of excellent ideas out there. And so we have an open source platform that fosters uh, innovation in any quarter that wants to contribute it. And then we work with those partners to bring the, the code in and make it high quality, high performance, high scale, and get it out to as many learners as possible. So open source is a, is a big part of what we do now. So here is our partners. Some of them may resonate with you, depending on where you're from. And here are some of our industry partners. And you'll see some names up there that might maybe surprise you, given our <coughs> Oops. Careful. Um, may surprise you, given our DNA. So Microsoft, Linux. Right? These are uh, companies that offer very practical uh, education programs that we find very, very useful companions to what we already provide, which are you know, sort of more academic in nature. At least they have originally been that. And so we are finding, as we talk to people around the world, not just people in the United States, but in all the countries of the world, that they really want to learn how to use tools from these providers. They want to learn how to use Excel. They want to learn how to use the programming suite. They want to learn how to use the Linux uh, environment. They're very interested in these practical uh, programs, and it's a big part of how they advance in their career. Not just get a degree, but advance in their career. So those partnerships are important to us. Here's some stats. Just absorb that for a second. Look at the top right corner. I'm trying to think of what I'm looking at. Top right corner. Uh, we're close. He said four plus million or something, I don't know, in the introduction. We're actually this close to five million learners in our system. We actually have bets going at work to see uh, what day, what hour is going to happen. But it's a, it's a huge, huge milestone for edX. And uh, I think it really shows the power of this kind of uh, an environment, this kind of uh, set of learning experience that we could attract in three years, uh, just three years, five million learners to our, uh, to our site and to our uh, courses. So let's talk about the themes. Enough about edX. Accessible. So this, um, I, I don't think this is probably too familiar to everybody, anybody in this room, but you know, for many, many years, for many, many years, and this is certainly the experience I had going through college, this is college, right? Guy, the board, love the diagrams in chalk. They're all sitting there very orderly. I, I love the jackets. Everybody wears a suit coat to, to class now, right? That's exactly how we know. Um, anyway, so this, this is a very typical sort of view of what a classroom might look like. Even if we fast forward, you can still see a classroom that looks a heck of a lot like that. And uh, you know, I think if you look across universities all over the country, every university continues to offer these courses. And there's a lot of value, the very close relation, small course. Uh, it's somebody with a lot of expertise trying to convey that knowledge to a small group of people. Nothing wrong with it, but there's more and different and better ways that we can try to grow here. Now, that's what people are doing. Right? More and more, a student is connected to a device. They're connected to a device, and they're learning when they want to learn. They're learning at night. They're learning in the middle of the night. God help you parents out there who kick off your kids in the middle of the night. Hopefully they're learning. Um, and what we found is when we analyze our data and take a look at some of the, um, the largest spikes in activity in the system, it's actually happening between midnight and 2 a.m. Not during when a class was happening. Not at 8 a.m. Not when you would have been sitting in your you know, freshman seminar or whatever course you were in. Between midnight and 2 a.m., middle of the night. And that's time adjusted, time zone adjusted, not just East Coast. So that's a really fascinating story that that tells about the student learning this way versus learning solely in their classroom. 
I think the other thing that's important here is that um, it's multi-device. I sat down with my daughter the other day, she's in high school, and uh, she has uh, four devices, I'm ashamed to admit. So she has an iPod, and she has an iPad, and she has a computer, and she has the TV, or the, you know, the monitor for the, the desktop computer. And she's using them all at once. And I'm trying to think to myself, what, what on earth is she doing with all four of these devices all at the same time? So I'm like, all right, I'll, get, I'll jump right in. Let me ask her, what on earth are you doing with all of these devices at the same time? Well, I'm chatting with so-and-so about the math homework. Then I actually have a Google Hangout going with, uh, with uh, you know, whoever, and we're talking about the history project. And then over here, actually, I'm writing notes because I want to make sure that whatever Jackie has said, I've written it down. And, you know, and she's just going through it. I'm like, oh, yes, actually, that all sounds very normal. And she's playing music through one of them. And I'm thinking, oh, that sounds really distracting. But no, she's just rolling. You know? And I'm thinking, wow, how does she do it. But this is the modern learner. This is what kids are doing in these, on these devices. And you just have to go there with them. And you have to meet them where they are. Now, I, I realize that's a privileged picture, right? The, who has four devices? But, but the story, I think, is still very true of how students want to encounter the material, how they want to see it. They want to see it in their own time, at their own pace, on the device that makes sense for them at the day of the time of day, on a subway platform, standing outside, wherever they might want to be. Here are some pictures of our mobile app, the drop in the bucket of mobile apps that are out there. But it's really important that we continue to keep very aware of the mobile story and that we make our mobile experience, just like everybody else out there is uh, working on their mobile device, or mobile support, uh, front and center. It's no longer going to be Browser first, oops, we better make a mobile app. It's mobile first, we'll make sure it works on the browser. That's where everything is going. Absolutely. I'm convinced of that. That's access from the point of view of how and what, right? But what about, you know, where? And I think that for a lot of our learners in particular, uh, it's really that they're, they're global learners. We have only 30% in the United States. Only 30% in the United States. Everybody else is from someplace else, one of those 192 countries that we had a stat up here about before. So our learner base is global. They're in different time zones. They expect high availability. They expect excellent performance. They expect us to build a system Right? that works for them where they are. They expect to be able to see transcripts on videos in the language that they speak. They expect us not to use services that don't work behind the Chinese firewall. They expect us to be able to give them the opportunity to download things because they have low bandwidth services wherever they happen to be. We participate in a zero rating program for people who can't access uh, services because they can't pay for the data. It's not about the app. It's not about the actual courseware. That's free. But the data costs money, right? So there's a lot of programs that we're part of, and many, many people in the higher ed space are part of, to reach that global audience because the United States is not the largest learner pool by a stretch, right? There's tons of learners, and they are increasingly looking for opportunities to raise their education. So we have a lot of tools that foster uh, communication, broad-based communication inside the app, discussion forums, increasingly synchronous experiences, opportunities to join teams, opportunities to look for people who have same time zone, same language, same interests in the course, people who want to earn a certificate, people who are just explorers and want to be able to just learn a little bit. and aren't going for any big, uh, you know, sort of credential. And they all interact together inside the MOOC. You'll see uh, it doesn't really look all that different, right? A group of people, a group of people. That's from a, I think that's an MIT class from a long time ago. And here, here's a class. 
This is a group that actually met up independently. They said, oh, we're in this MOOC together. Hey, I'm in this area. Do you want to get together? And independently of us, they got together and decided to take a picture of themselves. We're all part of this MOOC. We're all learning together. Let's, get a, let's meet and let's have a picture. And so that's where that photo came from. That's the classroom, right? This is a virtual classroom. And then they met. I think it's great. So these are our learners. Love the guy with the waterfall. I'd like to learn there. That looks good to me. But you see, the woman with kids and different age groups and different backgrounds, I mean, this is, I mean, I'm not making it up. This really is the uh, user base that we have. This is the learner base. All right? This is not, this is not a joke. People are really coming from absolutely everywhere. So lifelong. I think people, uh, you know, we talked about it a lot at Pearson. There's a huge amount of activity around lifelong learning, trying to reach people at different sort of levels of their educational attainment, trying to get people who are re-entering education after many years away. This is on a lot of people's minds. The recognition that the average age of people trying to get a bachelor's degree really is changing. It's no longer the 18 to 22 year olds on campus. This is not new information, but I think there's a couple of things that we've started to realize about what's going to make something successful that actually is going to address, address this lifelong learner goal. So here's some stats. Median age, 28. Probably, maybe some people thought that would be older, but anyway, 28 years old, youngest, 8 years old, oldest, 95. That, I love that. Um, I hope I'm still taking online courses at 95. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but, but, but look here, 30% uh, only are interested in actually getting the credential at the end of the course, right? The rest are just there to learn. So there's a lot that has been made of and a lot of fixation on completion and, oh, well, MOOCs, huge drop off. And all. it's not always people's goals. That's not their goal always, walking into a MOOC. Some of them are just there to learn as much as they're going to learn. And whether they earn the certificate or not is not the point. So I think we obviously were interested in people completing the courses. We want to make them the right length so the completion rates are high. Because we have found that at about seven, eight weeks, that's where the dip takes place. People stop. If they're not really invested for the long haul, the big drop off in courses that get completed if they're six, seven, eight weeks long versus courses that get completed if they're a full semester length. So that's an interesting learning that we've had from the data. But nonetheless, we also have to appreciate that there's a whole community of people out there. They just want to learn. And they don't care about the cert. And we have to acknowledge that and make sure that it's a possibility for them. Uh, notice to the educational level. 60% bachelors or higher. Talk a little bit about sort of initiatives trying to pull more people in who don't have those degrees. And yes, very important to um, meet the needs of a professional learner, people who already have a degree, people who are in a career, career changers. But we really want to pull more people in who haven't got a degree at all and make more access uh, available to them. So here's a couple of things I want to talk about that we have learned and now are making programs around. One, um, and I think this will be no surprise to anybody in this room, the college readiness gap. H how many people are aware of how many people gr graduate from the first college they matriculate in? Any guesses? 20%? 30%? It's about 50%. 50% of people graduate university in this country. That, that might surprise you, but it's actually true. And so they graduate, having matriculated in a college, they graduate. And um, that's, you know, that's a, not an awesome number, right? You'd like to have everybody graduate. You're going to enter, you're going to bother, you're going to get into college, you're going to go through the admissions process, you're going to get into whatever it is, community college or high, you know, high-end universities, or whatever. You'd like to think that people could graduate, but they don't. 50%. Uh, so that's a big gap. And a lot of it is about preparedness. A lot of it is about the match, actually. It's not so much the preparedness, but you know, you and I, we just, uh, you know, we didn't, 
we didn't do dating, we didn't date well enough. We didn't figure out that we liked each other well enough before we decided to get into this relationship as learner and, and teacher. So that's, um, you know, that's a lot of the reason why people drop out, whether they drop out of a program that's in the college or they drop out of the college altogether. It's about the match a lot of the time, not just the preparedness. A lot of people can't afford it. Right? This is actually very overwhelming, so they don't even try. They take a couple of college classes at night, or they take a couple online, but they don't finish. Right? There's a member of my family who, at 54 years old, just finished her bachelor's. That's a long path to get to a bachelor's degree. And it was blood, sweat, and tears. Last couple of years there, just to try to get it out, get it done. I am going to end my life with a bachelor's degree, come hell or high water. Right? So very long path that it can take to get people to that bachelor's degree. And we want to get more people there, people who can't afford it or have life-interrupting events or whatever it is, and make it more possible to get through more of uh, education. And then finally, when people get out of college, right, everybody's complaining in this country, not enough people to code, right? Not enough people to do IT jobs. Not enough people to do high-tech jobs. Struggling, struggling to recruit people to work in cloud computing. Who even knows what cloud computing is? I asked around a cocktail table at a party once, what, what is the cloud? Blank stares. <laughs> Nobody knew what the heck I was talking about. They're like, it's a computer somewhere? Sort of, yeah, it's sort of about that. <laughs> anyway, so I do, I do think that this, um, you know, raising a group, people who come out of college who actually have the set of skills needed to take on the jobs that are available, it's a big gap, right? And so even if you've gotten a great degree, high honors, successful path through college, you can still get out and say, yeah, that, that history degree didn't really give me what I needed to get the job that I need. No offense to the history people out there. I love history and I studied a lot in college. But I think that that's the gaps that we're seeing. Those are the ones that we have to address. So, how are we doing that? Program that we le released last year uh, to address college readiness. It's AP courses, but we also have uh, some courses that are not really specifically geared toward the AP exam, right? They're just geared toward college readiness. Getting students ready to encounter material that is at the level of difficulty, right? The level of engagement needed to really pass a college course or pass a whole degree program. And so the college readiness uh, courses ended up being overwhelmingly successful, but uh, here's an interesting statistic about them. Uh, half the students in the courses were in the age that you would think a high school student is, right? Somewhere between maybe 12 and 20. Let's give it a generous birth, okay? The other half were totally, two humps, the other half were all of those students' teachers taking the courses so they could teach the courses, right? So preparation for them as teachers to be able to then teach those courses in their own schools or to teach them using that course material in their own schools. So being able to facilitate AP programs in their schools where they didn't exist before. So it ended up, it wasn't actually what we planned. <laughs> it was a surprising result and an excellent one, one that we're very happy about. But just as we saw the demographics, we're like, huh, that is interesting. And started to talk with people and we realized this was a real emerging you know, trend of the, of the courseware. So that was kind of neat. Anyway, lots of courses, lots of enrollments. Uh, we grew our enrollment figure for 13 to 18 year old age group by 400% between the time that we released the courses, or before and the time we released the courses after six months. So that was incredible. And we have more coming. Here's a story. This is great. I can let you read it there, or I can read it. I'm looking forward to pursuing my dream of becoming a computer programmer. I've been accepted to the MIT class of 2018, an accomplishment that would not have occurred without edX and online learning. This kid lives in a really rural area, no access to college education, didn't really no, I think what was out there for him, he was a top performer in one of the MIT programming classes, and um, MIT saw that and recruited him. 
out of the program. So that, that's a big deal for some of our university partners to really observe some learners in action before they ever take a risk on them. This is very much a try before you buy kind of system, right? You can get in there, you can take a course, it's low risk for both of you, right? It's low risk for the university. They've, yes, made a huge investment in the course. They're delivering that course. It's a great experience for those who are completing the certificate and even for those who are just the casual learners. And it's a great experience for the learner. They don't have to pay for it. They can. They can get a verified certificate, but they don't have to. But it can really bridge worlds in a way that would not be possible otherwise uh, for the learners in those circumstances. And it, would hel it helps the universities recruit students they never would have seen before. So it's a, it's a really nice uh, way to facilitate matchmaking. It's not the only way that that happens, but it's, um, it's a trend that I, I hope can continue. People can really try the experience and then figure out, hey, is this what I want? Do I want courses like this? Do I want these subject areas? Do I want this experience? Oh, I, I got to try it, and they got to try me. We did a partnership with Launch Code. I made that kind of offhand comment about coders, but in fact, there are a lot of people who need um, engineers, software engineers, to, to build applications, to uh, facilitate the you know, moving of things digitally, to have them be in the cloud, to you know, do IT jobs, all over, every sector. Every sector, no matter what, needs jobs like this. And so we did a program with uh, Launch Code in St. Louis and um, had students take a course called CS50. CS50 is now almost its own piece of currency, right? You say, well, you have a Harvard degree. Well, that's, that's quite a piece of currency, right? It's gold, bullion, platinum, whatever you want to call it, right? That's a real piece of currency. But even just the course, one course, CS50, is starting to have its own currency. Oh, you, did you take that course? Yes, I did. Did you pass it? Yes, I did. I have my verified cert. I took CS50. Put it on your LinkedIn profile. That's something. It has real value, right? That course has a reputation. It's hard. I love it. If you go to our user stories, like Pablo Phillips, the last guy here on the slide, he, there's a great quote. He has a video. He says, uh, he said, you know what I really like about that course? It's hard. It's really hard. I actually have to really work hard to learn that course material. That has value. It's just not some throwaway thing. There's not just a couple videos, right? It's a hard course. It has real currency. So anyway, that's uh, this some, just some stories about some of the folks who went through the Launch Code. Launch Code offers uh, tutoring, mentoring, help. They kind of foster people through the program. They kind of get them through it. And you know, we have the course material, so that's the, that's the partnership. Here's one. I don't. I should have looked it up beforehand. I don't even really know what philology is. Somebody's going to tell me what that is afterwards, probably. Oh, philology is this. But anyway, this woman in Poland studied English philology, the teacher training program, and then uh, decided to take the HKUST, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology computer programming course in Java and wants to, you know, facilitate her own path to a new career. And she's doing it in very much a self-help model. But again, we want to f facilitate as many of these models as we can. Here's another one, facilitating career growth. A little bit different. A lot of the people who come to this course, they're paying for it, first of all. Just full disclosure, it's not a free course. It's one of our pay courses in professional education. But a lot of the people who take this course are very interested in learning in a small environment. They want to learn online. They want to learn this material from, from this professor from MIT, because they know that this is going to facilitate growth for them in their field. Big data, right? Everybody's got big data on their lips. What does that mean? What does it mean to you in your career? No, 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 really, what does it mean? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like big data is a mystery to a lot of people, and this course really does a nice job of dispelling that, that myth. And so this course is an extremely popular way to facilitate some career growth for people all over, all different industries. They don't have to matriculate at MIT. They don't have to join the professional education degree program, right? They just have to take this course, 400 bucks, 500 bucks. It is. And now they have this knowledge and can continue to care for it. Again, different kinds of currency. So personalized. 
Personalization is a really hard challenge. It's not necessarily as hard as you might think if you're working in a small classroom environment. There's lots of adaptive software out there. There's lots of personalized learning out there. Khan Academy, there's no person in the world probably who doesn't know what Khan Academy is now. They're offering uh, tons and tons of personalized course material for students to take in all different subjects. It used to just be math, but now it's everything, right? But doing this at scale, globally, in the context of a learning program, in the context of a full course of study is hard to do. It's hard to do at scale and hard to do high performance. And so we're starting to do that at edX, but it's not complete by any stretch of the imagination. Here's a quote which I really liked from Steve Mintz, uh, UT Austin's one of our partners. He says, the challenge ahead is to draw upon data to improve pedagogical practice, for example, by developing personalized adaptive learning pathways, e-tutors, and embedded embedded remediation to address weaknesses and build on student strengths. I like that, that part of it, the embedded remediation. I think re the way that Launch Code works, for example, they have people, right? I have a person and I talk to them and they kind of help me along and there's a lot of models like that where you have the course experience and the coaching, blended learning I'll talk about in a second. But this is automated, right? It's, it's the embeddedness of it that I think is really interesting here and being able to build that into every experience and say, hey, you know, you haven't logged in in a couple days. You should log back in. That's a very simplistic example. Or you took this pre-assessment. Now I've given you a personalized learning plan. This is what you should follow based on the things that you got right, objective-based. Right? These are the things that you need to continue working. Or continuous uh, suggestions, continuous feedback to the end user that says, here's where you're doing well. Here's where you need to continue to work. Let me pop this up for you and show you this new piece of learning material right now based on the learning outcomes that these course materials and this assessment was mapped to. All of that stuff requires you to collect the data, but then to do something with it. We are still very much at the collecting the data stage of things. And now we're starting to learn what to do with it. Here's a couple of examples of what we do for instructors. We're not quite there yet with students. This uh, graph, the green one, is actually all the videos in this uh, week of the course, this particular course. And you can see the green bar shows you the average stopping point of the student viewing the video. So not a single one of them, except that one in week three. That must have been a good one. Look at the length of it, right? Almost got to the end, <laughs> not quite. Just a tiny little abandon rate there at the end. But this is also telling. This graph tells you a lot, right? It says, make your video shorter. <laughs> but it also says, that's interesting, right, how, you, how people drop off. The second graph, the second graph actually is an indication of something that got routinely skipped. Oh, yeah, we just, yeah, that two-minute segment, that's boring. Skip. Somebody's lecturing on and on, blah, 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 <laughs> whatever they're doing in that piece. It skipped. The video analytics, it shows you, oh, you know, Maybe you want to consider redoing that video. Just saying. So I think these are just some of the, you know, just a little taste of what we do in our analysis. It's huge. It's mostly instructor oriented right now. Now we're working on interventions, remediations, things that students can look at, feedback loops, all the stuff that's characteristic of personalized and adaptive learning. There's a couple of things that we do now that start to gesture toward that, but aren't there yet. Uh, we do give immediate feedback on questions. And we really promote in our instructional materials to instructors about how to teach with the uh, software using assessments as formative assessments, not just summative assessments, but formative assessments to help people both get assessed and to learn at the same time, right? Not just to use the assessment as a test, but to use it as a way to learn. So immediate feedback with an explanation, not personalized, but at least something that lets the student know how they're doing in real time. This is, I, I got this from the internet. I did not make this meme up. This is a meme. If you go out and look for the green check, go look up edX green check mark or edX green check, you will find this. It is a thing on the internet. Kids are looking for the green, I shouldn't say kids. Students, learners are looking for the green check. They expect it. They want immediacy. They do not want to wait. That, my daughter with all the devices, she wants immediacy. She's not waiting until the next day to ask that question in class. She's getting the answer now, 
right? So that ubiquity of immediate feedback, something they can take, act on, do something about, they want that. Everybody wants that. We also give some hints, right? Students can elect to use the hint. They can get feedback that's not just, you got it right, you got it wrong. Some new ways that were, just a word about this particular, um, con this was a contribution from our open source community. We didn't build this, actually. We just thought it was awesome, and so we decided to put it in. But we didn't, we didn't build this software. It came out of our open source community, and they contributed it. It's a pretty substantial piece of functionality, and uh, just a huge, huge kudos to the community for being able to do this and then present it to us, and then for us to get it in. I think it was a giant effort on both sides, but uh, it was really cool. So blended. A lot made of blended learning, but I think for us, what we're most interested in is just outcomes. What are people going to get out of that? I can talk buzz phrase, blended learning, everybody's talking about it all the time, but really we just want outcomes. Successful campus-based experiences. Yes, we are going to continue to push the MOOC domain. Yes, we're going to continue to push access across the world. Yes, we're going to continue to scale and make high performance systems and availability of courses everywhere. But second pillar of our mission, campus education and making every student who ends up on campus someplace have a better experience and use technology to foster that. So we have a few examples there. We're kind of everywhere. Uh, we actually teach our instructors blended learning techniques. It's, they don't have to take the course, but it's something that we offer. So students, you can go, you can go sign up for this free course. I mean, no sweat, right? It's a couple of hours. I think it takes four hours to complete. You can have a certificate. Um, but I think this is a really good course that just sort of explores the issues. Whether you're building an edX or building something else, it's a nice course. So nowhere, and this is not to diminish our other partners, but nowhere is blended learning and the use of edX in conjunction with campus learning more prevalent than at MIT in the edX environment. These four out of five students at MIT use MITx in their learning every single day. It is a prevalent part of their experience. It is, will be, soon become a ubiquitous part of the experience at MIT. They are, using, they are whole hog into using the technology to facilitate learning on campus, to raise the quality of the dialogue that they can have in class by moving a lot of the routine, routine self-paced, right, self-motivated activity online. It's a little hard to read that last line, but it's interesting. In uh, this paper, and I'm going to actually show a video from this professor, Michael Sima, in a moment. Uh, they have a five-week flag, so you're there for five weeks, and how are you doing? Should we go talk to you? Are you, you know, this is part of the MIT experience. And in this course, it's a tough, it's a tough course, a real hard course. Uh, they went from having 29 students in 2012 to down to two. It's lowest it's ever been. Probably going to go down to zero eventually with the delta. So it's a pretty significant gain for them in that class the high dropout rate. So uh, why don't we have the video now and you can hear a little bit about what Professor Sina has to say. Volume. I'm breaking bonds here, I'm breaking bonds here, I'm breaking bonds here. Three by one is what we call a general institute requirement. The learning outcomes are all the same chemical principles as you would get in a university chemistry but the vehicle that you use to study those chemical principles are solids. The surface tension is just going to be the derivative. There's no textbook for the class. The online material developed for 391 x is the textbook for the class. Because the online content is so well organized and it perfectly matches my course, I don't feel so pressured in lecture to cover all the material. It's okay for me to stop and talk to the student, take questions, or do examples. They relatively constant. What we did was get rid of all the midterms and finals and convert them all to an online assessment in a proper environment. If they pass it, they know instantly because the computer grades it. If they don't pass it, they can come back and do it again the next day. 
It seems like the assessment is almost fulfilled the purpose of the test and it almost works simultaneously somehow. Because there are tests in the other classes where you know, have written exams every few weeks or so. It's definitely been a lot less pressure and stress than those. I'm a little more free to come in when I'm ready to take the assessments and do them whenever. These tools were built for the edX platform. And it's great because it's like automatically generating a brand new quiz each time the student sits down. Uh, some of the assumptions that we make about how to best do a student assessment may be flawed. My outcomes measures are not you knowing something, but you being able to do something. The nice thing about when they go back in, they've got a little practice under their belt if they failed once before, and so they've gone to talk to a TA. So like if you hit down on your like C2, what would that and so by the second time, the achievement rate is much, much greater. The problems that are in our database are exactly the same problems that appear on 3091 exams in the past 30 years. So I don't think it's any easier. I think it's just a better way to measure, and at least special way to measure. Yeah, this is an experiment. We'll study the outcomes. I'm a scientist, and so I'm doing my best to have the appropriate controls. I'm getting a sense that this is a sea change in the way 3091 is going to be taught. The course will never be the same uh, as it was going forward because of this experience. It'll be, it'll be better. Hey, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's an so, in the words of the professor himself, I don't want to. <laughs> speaks for itself. It's a really interesting experiment he's doing. He acknowledges it's an experiment. He's going to collect data as he goes. And, you know, I think ultimately his early findings are that it's really been very, very, very successful. And he'd like to figure out a way to make it scale, to make it continue, to have this as the experience that students have on campus, and to then spread that, you know, to other people and to continue to talk about what the success factors are of a program like that versus things that pitfalls, things that you can do that, that won't be as successful. So anyway, I just wanted you to hear it directly from, from this professor's um, mouth. So my final topic, unbundled, um, I don't know if anybody's following edX, but something that we announced earlier this year with ASU is uh, something called the Global Freshman Academy. And um, I think this is really some, you know, again, it's an experiment. Every single one of the partners we have is sort of willingly walking into this with us and trying to figure out what's going to work, what's going to be successful, and acknowledging that some things are not. So this experiment, Global Freshman Academy, is um, offering to students the ability to earn credit online through, open, through edX and in a way that does not require them to, to matriculate. They don't have to be accepted into ASU. They don't have to become an ASU student. They just have to take the courses. And on top of that, they don't even have to pay up front. They have to pay a nominal fee just to have proctoring turned on so that they can be considered for credit. But they don't have to pay for one bit of the credit experience until they pass the course. In fact, we don't allow it. We don't enable it. Right? You take the course for a small fee, $40. You pass it. And then we say, hey, would you like to apply for credit? You can get credit from ASU for this course that you just passed. That is game changing, right? Being able to actually, again, try before you buy. Is this going to work out? Do I want this credit? Is this what I'm working for? Is that why I've taken this course? I passed it. I may as well. You know, it's not free, but it's a lot cheaper. And the risk is so much lower. If you were an economist, Looking at the way that college admissions works today, you're like, wow, that is the riskiest thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm not investing in that. <laughs> That's crazy. It's risk on both sides. Why would I do that? Right? If you were an economist looking at this, you'd say, yeah, that's, that's closer. I'd like to, that's good. I'll do that. That's way less risky. I like that model. Right? Of course, economists don't design colleges, but I'm just saying, I think there is some truth in that, right? It's a high risk proposition getting into school and then deciding, yep. This is what I'm going to do. So here's a few quotes. Potentially disruptive innovation in education. Lots of good, good press on that. So 
I'm changing the title of my first slide. And I'm saying these are the six themes that now dominate the higher ed online, and I think will come to dominate higher ed everywhere. But I think this is, this is today. This is not even the future. It's here. It's here and it's happening. And the degree to which it becomes pervasive is the thing that I think all of you and so many of the other people that I get to work with every month and every year are really thinking through, experimenting with, and trying to make work. So thank you, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.